Thank you for tuning in to RTM Nation Online, where we believe that you will receive the abundance of peace, prosperity, security, stability, health, healing, and truth. If you would like to learn more about the ministry, click the link below. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Now let's get into the message. Oh gosh, my, my assignment today, even though I'm going to put a lot of words around it, is very simple. God, and I went through a lot of stuff. I was like, ooh, I could teach on this. Ooh, I could teach on that. God just kept moving that out of the way. He said, no, we're talking about victory lap still, just so you guys know. But he said, there is one word I want them to walk out of here with. And that word is winner. Amen. Winner. You're going to hear the word winner so much in the next few minutes that you're going to say, does pastor know another word? But just know the whole point of telling you so often is that God wants it to be so rooted in your spirit that no, nothing can uproot it. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, last week we began our series on Victory Lap. And in that, what we said was there are three attributes, at least three attributes of victory that we wanted to share and talk about. Those attributes were these. Number one, <coughs> victory has a position. Number two, victory has a mindset. And number three, victory has a sound. During our initial session, we talked about the position of victory. And in talking about the position of victory, we started off by defining a term. And that term was victory lap. And that term is just like it sounds. Whenever you have some type of competition or competitive event, it can be a sport, it can be war even, the winner takes another stroll around what we could call the battlefield. And the whole purpose of that stroll is to let everybody know, all the onlookers know that, hey, I'm the winner. There are people who say that Jesus took a victory lap after running his race. They say that his race was all of the work that he did in the context of the cross. Now, that work is good for us because that work gives us the opportunity to get ourselves right with God. So we're good with that work that he did. And they said that his victory lap was all the different appearances that he made to hundreds of people after his resurrection. We thought about that a little bit and we said, you know what? We really don't have any issue with people saying that he took a victory lap. We're pretty good with that. We did, though, have a caveat to when that victory lap began. We said, we don't believe Jesus' victory lap began after the resurrection. We said that his resurrection began way before then. His victory lap began way before then. You know, way before his resurrection, way before the cross, way before he was even birthed into this earth, we said that God had already announced Jesus the victor. And he did that in the book of Genesis. And the whole ordeal with the serpent and Adam and Eve, when he told the devil at that moment, I'm going to produce an offspring through the woman and that offspring is going to crush your head. On that word, Jesus was already walking in his victory. Now, we threw a lot of words at that discussion. But the bottom line of it all was and still is this. There are many believers who walk this earth working to run a race to secure their victory. You ain't got to do all that. If you are one with Christ, you are victorious already. Jesus has run the race and he's already taken the victory lap. Question for you. Why in the world would you run a race that has already been run for you successfully? Why would you go in your pocket and pay a debt that someone has already paid on your behalf in full? Why would you do any of those things? 
Why in the world would you jockey for a position and that position has already been offered to you freely? The moment we accepted Jesus, we were translated to the winner's circle. If you look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 19, in the easy to read version, it lets us know, Paul is talking here, that when we accept Christ, we become a member of God's family. It reads this way. So now you non-Jewish people are not visitors or strangers, but you are citizens together with God's holy people. You belong to God's family. Go to Colossians 3, Amplify Classic. Once you are in God's family, once you have become a joint heir with Christ, you effectively become a person who is hid in Christ. Say hid in Christ. Hid in Christ. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1, Amplify Classic. If then you have been risen with Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, and set your minds and keep them set on what is above the higher things, not on things that are on earth. For as far as this world is concerned, you have died and your new life, new real life is hidden with Christ in God. Now, if you look at this scripture, it says. Your new real life, it uses the phrase is hidden with Christ in God. But we simply say it is, your life is hid in Christ. And when we say your life is hid in Christ, we're talking about in the context of the completeness of his work. We're talking about in the context of the, in the authority of what he did. We say that as your life is hid in Christ. Given that we are hid in Christ, and Christ has already won the victory. Family, we are hid in victory. In addition to be hidden in victory, Jesus did a work such that he said, when I leave, I'm not going to leave you by yourself. He said he was going to send back a comforter. That comforter's name was the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us also that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they are one. So if the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, we have God on the inside of us. Amen. As believers, when you have God on the inside of you, we can say that you're not just hid in victory. The very source of victory is hidden in you. So not only are we hid in victory, victory is hidden in us. So if I have victory on the inside of me and I have victory all around me, what other place would I stand than, the, than in the winner's circle? There is no other place for me to stand but in the winner's circle. I got victory inside of me and I got victory all around me because I'm immersed in Christ. There is no other place for me and there is no other place for you as a believer but the winner's circle because Jesus has already secured our victory. Yes. Now that would be your recap of last week. And that's a good recap of last week. As a matter of fact, when we finished last week, we summed it up with the saying. And let's say that saying again today. Say, once I accept Jesus, once I accept Jesus my life is hidden, is hidden victory and victory, and victory is, hidden is hidden in me. So my starting position, so my starting position is, the is the winner's circle. That's right. Since Jesus is hidden in you and Jesus is, is all around you, your starting position family is the winner's circle. Now, knowing that our starting position is the winner's circle, that's the perfect launching place for what we want to talk about today. And that's the next attribute. And that is victory has a mindset. 
we want to talk about the mentality surrounding a victor. And when we're talking about that mentality, that mentality rests or is embodied in two statements. And we want these statements to be anchors in your thought process. The first one is this. I am a winner. Say that with me. I am a winner. Yes. I am a winner. Of course, when I make a statement like I am a winner, when you say I am a winner, we can all sit here all day and say that I am a winner. You can say I am a winner. But the truth is, even though that statement is true, there are some days where I don't feel much like a winner. And I think if you were honest with me, you would say there are some days you don't feel much like a winner. There are some days that winner's medal that you theoretically wear around your neck, you don't feel like it's there. You know, like when you go to get a new car and that loan application gets denied. You walk into work on the top of the world and they lay you off. You take a test, you don't pass. You walk in the house feeling good, your spouse talking about separation. You loving your kids with all you got and them rascals say they hate you. You put in a valid insurance claim and your claim gets denied. Family, sometimes you just don't feel like a winner. Sometimes I just don't feel like a winner, but we are. Sometimes you don't feel like you standing in the winner's circle, but you are. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm standing in the winner's circle, but I am. And whenever I get that feeling, whenever I get that feeling, I just remind myself, Benjamin, boy, you are not just hid in victory, but victory is hidden in you. Whenever you get that feeling, you need to tell yourself, I'm not just hidden in victory, but victory is hidden in me. I'm not just hidden in Christ, but the Holy Spirit is hidden in me. I'm not just hidden in God, but God is hidden in me. And if God is hidden in me, if I'm not just hidden in God, that means that there is a winner in me. Amen. That's your second statement. Your second statement is there is a winner in me. <coughs> Those two things need to be foundational. They need to be anchors. They are certain things. They are statements that should be locked in to a victory person's state of mind. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. It don't matter what they say about me. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. It don't matter what they saying about you. You are a winner and there is a winner in you. It don't matter what it looks like. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. It don't matter what I'm going through. I am a winner and there is a winner in me. Get this. It don't matter the negative things you saying about yourself. You override that negative chatter. You override that debasing chatter. You override that self-defeating chatter with the truth that you are a winner and there is a winner in you. You are a winner and there's a winner in you. You are hid in Christ. The Holy Spirit is hidden in you. Christ has run the race. He has won the race. He has taken the victory lap. He has put you in the winner's circle. You are a winner and there is a winner in you. 
those statements have to be staples in your mentality as a believer. Say this with me. I am a winner. And there is a winner in me. One more time. I am a winner. And there is a winner in me. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. You are a winner. Yes, you are. And there is a winner in you. Yes, there is. Having the right mindset is so important, family. Because if you don't have the right mindset, believe it or not, you can actually convince yourself that you are a loser, even though you are a winner. Go to Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 1 in the Message Bible. The book of Judges has an account of a man named Gideon. Gideon did not see himself as a winner, even though God was at all the while trying to commission Gideon to do something great. Starting in verse 1, the Message Bible, it reads, Yet again, the people of Israel went back to doing evil in God's sight. God put them under the domination of Midian for seven years. Now, just to summarize the upcoming verses 2 through 10, as you can see, the people of Israel were not doing what God wanted them to do. So God put them under the rule of Midian. And if you read those other verses, it says stuff like the, the folks in Midian took everything they had. They invaded them and took over like a, like a swarm of locusts. It actually says that the folks in Midian took the children of Israel down to a grinding poverty. Down to a grinding poverty. We pick it up in verse 11. One day the angel of God came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abyssalite, whose son Gideon was thrashing wheat in the wine press, out of sight of the Midianites. Now he had to hide because they were taken over. The angel of God appeared to him and said, God is with you, O mighty warrior. Gideon replied, with me, master? If God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Loved ones, situations and circumstances can have you asking that same question at times. If God is with me, then why? And we can fill in the blank. If God is with me, why do I feel this way? If God is with me, why is this happening to me? If God is with me, why are they saying those things about me? If God is with me, why is this not working out? If God is with me, why is this doggone thing so hard? If God is with me, why? 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 If God is with me, then why? Events in this life, family, is no indication of God's presence. God is present regardless. Events in this life is no indication of God's authority. God is almighty regardless. We should never allow situations and circumstances to cause us to conclude that God is not there. Because no matter where you are, no matter what you're going through, no matter the outlook, no matter what you're thinking, God's right there. Verse 13, Gideon replied, with me, my master, if God is with us, why has all this happened to us? Were all the miracle wonders our parents and grandparents told us about telling us, didn't God deliver us from Egypt? Where was all that stuff? Where are all those miracles that you supposedly did way back in the day? Why are we in this situation, God? 
The fact is God has nothing to do with us. He has turned us over to Midian. But God faced him directly. Go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I sent you? Now we're going to pause here for a second because I think that in verse 14, God is not just making a general statement. We have Gideon talking about God's deliverance in Egypt. God follows that up by saying, Gideon, go in the strength that is yours. I believe that God is answering a question there. I believe God is answering a question that Gideon has in his heart right there. And to clarify it, I'm going to ask you to go to Exodus. We're coming back to Judges. Go to Exodus chapter 3 in the Message Bible. When you get to Exodus chapter 3, we're going to be starting at verse 7. But just to put us all in context and to get us all oriented, this is the account where God appeared to Moses in the midst of the burning bush. And God has just told Moses, hey, man, listen, I want you to take the shoes, take the sandals off your feet because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. And we're going to jump into God's engagement with him right now. Starting in verse 7. God said, talking to Moses, I've taken a good long look at the affliction of my people in Egypt. I've heard their cries for deliverance from the, their slave masters. I know all about their pain. And now I've come down to help them, pry them loose from the grip of Egypt, get them out of that country and bring them to a good land with wide open spaces, a land lush with milk and honey, the land of the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite. The Israelite cry for help has come to me, and I've seen for myself how cruelly they're being treated by the Egyptians. It's time for you to go back. I'm sending you. Right there on those words, Moses probably said, hold up, God. <laughs> hold up. You know, if that was with your friend, like, hold up, partner. What exactly are you talking about? You're sending me. You just told me you've come down. Go to verse 8. Now, Moses didn't have this in print like we did, like we do. But if you go to the beginning of verse 8 in the Message Bible, God says to Moses, not Moses go down. God says, now I have come down to help. I have come to pry them loose. I have come to get them out. I have come to bring them to a good land. God, that's something you said you was going to do. What's all this chatter about? Hey, I'm getting ready to send you Moses to Egypt. God, what's all that about? Why you got to send me if you going to go down? Family, there are times that we are looking for a move of God when all we got to do to see a move of God is move our feet. Yes. There are times when we're looking to hear a word from God when all we got to do to hear God speak is open our mouth and say what thus says the Lord. Yes. There are times where we're looking for God to do a great work when all we got to do to see God do a great work is to put our hand to the plow and push. There are times where we're looking where we're looking for a move of God when all we need to do to see a move of God is to be an active, willing vessel through which God can show himself great. Amen. Moses is like, yo. Why I got to go down if you say you the one come down to go down, he said, listen, boy. I'm going down, but I'm going down through the vessel that I'm calling. Right here, God is setting the stage that he is the deliverer. 
but that the deliverance is going to come through Moses. There are times in our lives that we can call on God for deliverance when the deliverer is already there and ready. The issue is not the deliverer. The issue is the vessel not recognizing that he or she is a winner. The issue is not the deliverer, but the mentality of the vessel. What makes the vessel a winner? Let's keep reading here in Exodus 3. Verse 12 is going to tell us. Starting at verse 10, though, God is talking. It's time for you to go back. Talking to Moses. Moses don't want to hear this. It's time for you to go back. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the people of Israel out of Egypt. Moses answered God, but why me? What makes you think I could ever go to Pharaoh and leave the children of Israel out of Egypt? Verse 12, family, read those first four, four words with me. Go. I'll be with you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. God, whatever make you think I can, I'll be with you. Whatever makes you think I can, I'll be with you. Whatever makes you think, I'll be with you. Once God says, I'll be with you, translation, winner. God says to Moses, I'll be with you. And we can translate that to one word, and that word is winner. Return back to Judges 6. We're going to pick back up at verse 14. Now, remember in verse 13, Gideon was talking all about God, you know, why me? Getting ready to, to, to tell God why he's not able, why he can't do it. And he, he's also jawjacking about all the deliverance God did in Egypt. But God interrupts him. Now, it don't say God interrupts him, but what it says is, go to verse, go to verse 14 for me. Verse 14, Judges chapter 6. It says, but God faced him directly. He's talking, but God faced him directly. Now, anybody who's a parent will know this move. It's a classic parent move. It's, 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 it's one of the basic parent moves that, now you might be a parent, if a parent just got one child and they knew, they don't know the move. But you get somebody that got about two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight kids, they know the move. They got the move down. Let me describe the move for you. Because he says, God faced him directly. Here's the, here's the move. You got your kids in the back seat. You at the window, maybe you're ordering something or somebody talking to you. I don't know what you're doing, but they back there jaw jacking. And you're like, hey, y'all need to be quiet. But they still talking. They just talking over you. You trying to be nice. You know you might be around company. You don't want to slap them, but they still jaw jacking. Anybody that's a parent know what I'm talking about. So they still talking. And listen, you already told them one time, be quiet. But you tell them again, hey, y'all need to keep it down, be quiet. But they still hitting, they start they bothering me. They still making all this fuss, making all this noise. But at some point in time, when you had enough, all you do is look at them. <laughs> now look, you've been talking the whole time. But when you look at them directly, and all the words that you want to say and the damage that's going to come to them, if they don't act right, all of a sudden the message is conveyed in a, in a, in a glance more than any amount of words have ever said. Look, I am married, got three children, got children with children, and I can tell you right now, as the quote-unquote head of my household, my wife then gave me that look and caused me to stand up straight. <laughs> and I ain't no pushover. <laughs> but when she asked me to do something a couple of times and I don't do it and I keep doing what I'm doing and I look at her and I say, what's wrong? And she just hit me with that. <laughs> I know I better get on my P's and Q's. Why? 
because that look directly interrupts you and says, now listen to me for a change. The Bible says that boy was jaw jacking and God faced him directly. That's an interruption. Let me interrupt what you what you spitting out of your mouth, son. The Bible says in verse 14, but God faced him directly. And God says, go in this strength that is yours. Gideon, I want you to go in the strength that is yours. And that strength that is yours is the same strength that Moses had. That strength is me. Yes, Israel endured many years of oppression in Egypt. And yeah, I delivered them. Yeah, I did a lot of miracles. But all of that deliverance and all of those miracles, that strolled into Egypt within a vessel. Moses was the conduit for all of those miracles. As a matter of fact, there is a certain way we can look at it where getting, we can say, Moses was the miracle. Gideon, do you want to be a miracle? Gideon, you can be a miracle if you want to. Gideon, Go in the strength that is yours. That strength is me. When I sent Moses to Egypt, he walked into that space. And because he was with me, he walked into that space or walk in miracle. Boy, you can be a miracle, too, if you want to. Family, each and every one of us in this room can be a miracle for God if we want to. Judges 6, once again, this time, verse 14 through 16, Message Bible. But God faced him directly. Go in this strength that is yours. Save Israel from Midian. Haven't I sent you? Gideon said to him, me, master? How and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh. And I'm the runt of the litter. God said to him, what are those four, four words, family? I'll be with you. Sound familiar? Just like he told Moses, now he's telling Gideon, boy, I will be with you. Translation, winner. God is explaining to this boy. Hey, listen, Gideon, I'm a winner. And because I'm going to be with you, you're a winner. We got to realize also that this, this example that we're saying God is tying to Moses, it's not limited to just Moses. God knows that Gideon knows his people's history. Gideon know way more than about Moses. So God's example of, of Moses and Egypt and all that stuff, that's not limited to just Moses. God is reflecting back on this boy's entire heritage. If we were to do a more fuller description of what God is saying, God is saying, hey, listen, Gideon. I am a winner. And through me, all of your ancestors were winners. Abraham was a winner through me. Isaac was a winner. Jacob was a winner. Joseph was a winner. Moses, winner. Joshua was a winner. Come on, son. Don't you get it? Get with the program. Look, I'm a winner. He might even, 
I'm a winner. They were winners. Everyone I touch is a winner. Wouldn't you like to be a winner too? <laughs> you know what I mean? He could have he sang that thing to him. <laughs> Look, boy, I'm a winner. All your ancestors through me were winners. Everybody I touch is a winner. Gideon, wouldn't you like to be a winner too? <laughs> Gideon, come on, take heart, son. I will be with you. I'm sending you forth in the strength that is yours. Look back on verse 15. Let's talk about how Gideon refers to himself. It reads like this. God is telling him to go. God tell him he wanted to do something. 15 says, Gideon said to him, me, my master, how and with what could I ever save Israel? Look at me. My clan's the weakest in Manasseh. And I am the runt of the litter. Here, Gideon displays the trademark of a loser. The tra trademark of a loser is this. Someone who could pile up a host of reasons as to why they cannot succeed before they've even got started. If you were to go through what he said and put together a couple statements, here is the gist of what you come up with. Gideon is belittling what he has. Gideon is minimizing his abilities. And Gideon is devaluing who he is. We can say that Gideon is in effect calling himself a loser. And that's not much different than what Moses did. Moses had a similar, similar spin on it. Recall these words. Exodus chapter 3 verse 11, Moses said to God, but why me? What makes you think that I could ever go to Pharaoh and lead the children of Israel out of Egypt? The NIV version of what Moses said, that was Exodus 3, verse 11, by the way. He said to God, God, who am I to do what you're asking me? Who am I to do what you're asking me to do? Moses and Gideon both had their conversations with God and they begin it by proclaiming, what they could not do. That shall not be our mentality, family. We shall not be people that proclaim what we cannot do before we even get started. We will not proclaim our defeat before the game has even begun. Because we know before the game gets started that we are already winners. <coughs> we are winners and we know that we can do all things through the strength that is ours and that strength is God. <coughs> now I want to share a saying with you. The first Two sayings, actually. The first saying is not mine. I didn't make it up, and you've heard it before. The saying is this, wolf in sheep's clothing. You've all heard that before, right? Yes. The basic implication of that is that there is a person maybe standing right before you who, even though they look like they might be in your best interest, they really don't mean you no good. They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. They're dressed theoretically like a sheep that's harmless, but on the inside, they are a ravaging wolf. Now, that's the statement to the negative. I'm going to share with you a statement that I have. It's not a Smithism. It's just a Smith boy saying. But it, it has a positive bent to it. And I think it fits in very good to the mentality that we want to have as winners. Here's the saying. 
God often looks to send a winner in loser's clothing. God often looks to send a winner in loser's clothing. Now, if you search the Bible for yourself, and I, I, I ask you to please do so, I think you will find that to be true. You may not put it in the context of winners and losers, but you will find that it's true. True that God sometimes will take the most least probable of people to do the impossible. Sometimes God will take the most ordinary of folk to do the miraculous, to do the spectacular. You may put it in another way, but I just simplify it to say this. Sometimes God will send a winner and lose his clothing. <clears throat> Here is where I say, right there with that statement, that God will send a winner and lose his clothing is where we're going to pick up next time. But until then, but until then, I want you to know that situations in your life do not define your victory. God does. So I want you to go in the strength that is yours. Circumstances in your life does not dictate your victory. God does. So I want you to go in the strength that is yours. Hey, look, your past don't define your victory. God does. So I want you to go in the strength that is yours. God is a winner. God is a winner. You are hid in victory, and victory is hid in you. Know for a certainty that your feet stand in the winner's circle and that you are a winner. <clears throat> know for a fact that when you go in the strength that is yours, that strength is God himself and that your starting designation is winner. In closing, let's say this together. I am a winner, and there is a winner in me. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Each and every one of you need to know, let that be your anthem. I am a winner because you are, and there is a winner in you because thank God there is. I'll chat with you guys next week. We pray that today's message was a blessing to you. If you would like to help us further expand the vision, simply text the word Give RTM to the number 41444 or visit us online at www.revealingtruth.org. Now remember, Jesus loves you.